Hey everyone, it's me, Kirk Mastin, here at Mastin Labs. We've got a really special show for you today. We're going to be doing boudoir edits using Mastin Labs. So I can't wait to show you. Um, we have got a lot of uh, great images to work with today, and I'm going to go through two kind of major things. I'm going to be going through what you have to do to actually set up your photo to be good or to have a good edit, to make it look right, to have the right mood. And then I'm going to go through how to actually use uh, different Mass and Labs presets or styles to get that look. So 90% of it, well, in any kind of photography, 90% of it is what happens before you actually take the photo. And the last 10% really should be done in post-production. So that's like editing, using Lightroom, Capture One, whatever you'd like. Okay, so like I was saying earlier, the major component to a great photo is what you do before you actually take the picture. So it's your, it's the light. It's always the light that's really important. It's the location, the lens you're using. And I'm not talking about how sharp it is. I'm talking about the aperture that you're shooting it at and the length of the lens itself. And then I've got a few presets or styles that I think work particularly well for boudoir. So I'm gonna talk about light first. A really good boudoir photo has beautiful light. Let me show you. Um, all right, pull it up in the reference view here. So here are some raws. So this is by Stacy Kralau, Kralau. One day I will get that name, the last name right. Um, this is just a raw image. Uh, she also sent in this one and this one. These are just raw images, haven't done anything to them yet. Uh, then we've also got an image by Kristen Pei where there, there's this woman under the skylight and then we have this image by Hannah Wagner where we've got uh, two girls in front of this window, um, a little bit of tungsten light from the front and then mostly backlit. And what's interesting about all of these images is the light in them. Let me increase the exposure just a little bit. There we go. And I'll do the same on this one. Let's start with this image. So this isn't even edited yet. But I wanna talk about the light. As you can see, a lot of these images have light coming from behind, so like behind the model. This kind of directional, well, I guess you'd say a little bit harsher or contrast to your light is really good if you want a dark and moody type of boudoir image. If you wanted a light and airy boudoir image, I would recommend looking at our light and airy editing uh, sessions that we do on Facebook Live and just follow that. Even though those happen outside usually, if you've got a model inside with a lot of light on them from the front um, and diffused and they're wearing white in front of a white background, it's essentially a light and airy photo, even if it's boudoir. We're gonna be talking about more dark and moody. So to get there, you need to have the right kind of light to start with and that starts with this directional backlit light coming from behind. So behind this model, there's a big window right here, which is kind of raking across the front of her. Um, in this case, we've got, you know, essentially the same lighting scenario. We've got a big window with light coming from behind. And you'll notice that the, the photographer that Stacy exposed for the highlights, mostly for the highlights, not completely, but mostly for the highlights. So we've got a little bit of detail on the front of each model. Um, there might be some light reflecting off of a wall behind Stacy to behind her that are, is reflecting the light from the window back onto the model, um, which gives a little bit of fill right here on the side of the face. But for the most part, it's kept pretty dark. In this, in this lighting situation, we've got just a soft overhead diffused light coming from a skylight above the model and the environment is pretty dark. There's a little bit of fill light coming in from over here, probably from some other windows that are down below, you know, giving a little bit of light up from the bottom across the front here. But, whoops. But overall, it's, it's pretty contrasting and directional. I'm gonna lower the exposure just a little bit there. But this is the first aspect of a good boudoir photo is the light. Directional, backlit, window light. 
So it's the first rule. I, it's not even a rule. It's just a checklist. F photography is wonderful that way. Once you master it, you can kind of make your own rules. But this is just a good starting point. Um, for a dark and moody photo of any type, whether it's boudoir, outside, whatever, wardrobe is really important. And now I know in boudoir, like there isn't much wardrobe. Um, there's less wardrobe, but it still matters. So I recommend darker or neutral tones for wardrobe. Um, you wouldn't have quite the same impact in this photo if the top that she was wearing was like bright red with like white polka dots on it. And then in the background, there was like a big purple, like really bright couch or something you're not gonna be in the right tonal range. All the tones in these images in general are very earth tones, like earthy browns, grays, neutrals, greens, super important. Okay, so that's the light, the location. So the location itself is darker neutral, the clothing is darker neutral. Now the lens. For a lot of boudoir photos in general, we're trying to establish some kind of intimacy that we are near the people that we're shooting. The longer the lens that you use, so the longer meaning the greater the millimeter range, like so there's like a 35 millimeter lens, a 50 and an 85. The longer that focal length is, the more distant your subject is gonna feel in the photo. So if you want a very intimate feeling, you're gonna to wanna to stick with either a normal lens, which is like a 50 millimeter lens, or like a 35 millimeter lens. Anything wider than that, you can use, but you have to be just very careful that you don't have such a wide lens that you're distorting the image where everything around the edges gets elongated and weird looking. You wanna keep it natural, but you want it to feel intimate. And that is why you would use either a normal lens, and when I say normal, it's called a normal lens because humans see at about a 50 millimeter uh, width, like a, a 50 millimeter lens. We call it normal because that's how we see. If we were like pigeons, we would be like 12 millimeter view, like seeing like almost behind us. Um, you wanna use normal or a little bit wide. So that's the lens part. All these photos, let's well, see, this is shot with a 50. This one is shot with a 50, pretty close up. This image is shot with a 35 millimeter lens. This image is shot with a 35 millimeter lens. And this image is shot with a 35 millimeter lens. Secrets of the great boudoir masters exposed. It's, it's a 35 millimeter lens is a great place to start if you're wanting to really get into this type of photography. So again, directional light. You want contrast, you want window light, you want it to be dim. Location, darker neutral tones, clothing, darker neutral, earthy, lens, normal, AKA a 50 millimeter lens or wider. Uh, and then the last part, and now we're gonna get into actually editing, is that there are certain presets or styles that suit a dark and moody edit in general. So we're gonna be doing dark and moody boudoir today. And I'm gonna focus on three different, well, four different presets today. So we've got Portra 160 from the Portra original pack. We've got Portra 160 pushed one stop and Portra 160 pushed two stops. And those are from the, you guessed it, Portra push pack. Great pack, especially if you're into dark and moody. And then we've got my new favorite preset by far is Superior 400 from the brand new Fuji Color Everyday Original pack that we just released. So these three are really well suited to boudoir. Um, I would stay away from the Fuji original pack for boudoir. That's really made for light and airy. If you're looking for a light and airy boudoir photo, Fuji original is where you wanna be. So with that, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna start with this image here. I'll do a few edits for you. I, I, I increased the, uh, the uh, exposure just a little bit because it was quite underexposed when it was shot. So, so yeah, to start from scratch, I'm gonna increase the exposure just a little bit. You can either apply the preset first or increase the exposure. I normally suggest applying the preset before you do anything, but I know this needs an exposure bump. And then I'm gonna do Portrait 160. And then 
at this exposure, it's it's a little it's a little bit dark in the shadows. So what you can do is you can use one of the tones from the tone profile section down here to just bring out a little bit of detail in the shadows. And I think that's all this image really needs. So I'm going to do shadow soft, and that brings out a little bit of that shadow detail. And in fact, I'm going to do that and increase the exposure just a little bit again. And we have just a really beautiful image that's dark and moody, but it has a very nice three-dimensional quality to it. There's a lot of depth to the image. It's moody. It looks really nice. I didn't even have to touch temperature or tint in this image. Uh, just a note on why I chose Portrait 160 is that this preset, which comes from the actual film, Portrait 160, beautiful film, doesn't have a lot of saturation. So when you're, when you're editing a dark and moody photo or any kind of dark light, uh, if you're in any kind of dark lighting situation or dim lighting situation, too much saturation is really easy to have happen, or that's a very terrible sentence. It's easy for the image to be too saturated because you're working in a very dimly lit situation. When you increase the exposure of something or you light it a lot brighter, you can add a lot of saturation and it looks normal, it looks fine. But as you go darker, you want uh, presets or styles that don't have as much saturation and Portra 160 is the least saturated of the three in the Portra original pack. I'll show you Portra 400 for comparison. So let me uh, create a copy of this. Same edit, but with Portrait 400. Let me just reset this here. Uh, we'll, we'll increase the exposure again. And then here is Portrait 400. So it still looks really nice. I mean, it's, it's a, still a beautiful image. But if you compare it with Portrait 160, you can see that it's I don't know, it's just a little bit different. I, I feel that Portrait 160 on the left just has that really nice kind of moody, earthy tone to it without the skin being too saturated. Two is a relative word, but the Portrait 400 image on the right still looks really good, but it's starting to get quite a bit more saturated. So that's why I recommend Portrait 160. Um, let's do one more comparison here. Oh, and by the way, if anyone has any questions while I'm editing, feel free to put them in the comments and either Kyle or Casey will kind of flag me down and I'll answer them for you. So I love doing that. I love for it to be live and interactive. So don't be afraid to do that. All right, so here's Portrait 160. Now let's compare that to the other three or four presets that I recommend for Moody Boudoir. Okay. So in the uh, Portra Push Pack, you have all of the Portra films again, Portra 160, Portra 400, and Portra 800. But they're quite a bit different because they're pushed. When you push film, you change the development time. And what happens is that you get a shift in the shadows. You get, you get some kind of color tone in the shadows, and you increase the contrast of that film. So Portra 160, when you start to push it, starts to go a little bit red in the shadows, and it can look really, really great on dark and moody images. So I'm gonna reset the uh, Portra 400 one here. Actually, I'm gonna get out of comparison mode. And I'm gonna do a Portra 160 edit, or pushed edit. So here it is, um, push two stops. And I love the, I love that look. So it's got a little bit more contrast to it. You're starting to get kind of a beautiful red, uh, kind of red brown tone in the shadows. If you pair that with uh, Shadow Soft, and I'm gonna just tweak the uh, exposure here a little bit, you get a very moody image. It's really wonderful. You've got a little bit of that kind of brown red in the foliage in the back here, but you still have little sprigs of the plant that are still true green. So we're not in, we're not about like making the whole image like totally brown and red. Um, that's just not how film would go, I guess, unless you really underexposed it. We're trying to keep a true film look here. And so that means that green still exists. Green is still a color. It actually exists, but you can introduce those really cool kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say hipster, but those kind of vibes into the shadows with Portrait 160 pushed 
two stops. So that's my other favorite look for boudoir. Um, I'm gonna make another copy of this and then show you Superior 400 from the latest pack. And then I'll show you all three of them side by side. All right, so I'm gonna increase the exposure again. Go to the brand new pack here and click on Superior 400. This is a much warmer film than, I mean, as you can see immediately. Um, but what I love about it is that it, it, it makes the image warm but keeps the shadows cool and neutral. And it also has a little bit of a fade in the shadows. Not like an extreme fade, but just enough. Um, ah, man, I just love it. I, it's Hopefully you can see it at home, um, but I love it. So this is Superior 400. I'm gonna actually cool it down just a tiny bit and do Shadow Soft and bring the exposure down just a tiny bit. I wanted to also note that in all of my edits, I'm keeping it really, really simple. That's one of the best parts about Mass and Labs is that we've worked really hard to model every film uh, in a way where you can get a good look in just a few clicks. So I'm not diving into the HSL panel. I'm not going all over the place. I'm just applying the preset, maybe adding a tone profile if needed, and then adjusting exposure, temperature, and tint. And that's all you need to do. That's, that's it. Keep it really simple. Because as you know, we often have shoots where we've got like 600 photos to edit and it can be exhausting to have to like hand edit or manually tweak a bunch. So we've, we've really worked hard to make it simple for you. All right, here we go. Let me make this side panel a little bit smaller. And in, in fact, I'm gonna just minimize these so you can really see them. So these are my three favorite, my top three presets or styles for boudoir. On the left, on the far left, we've got Portra 160, really nice and desaturated. In the middle, we've got Portra 160 push two stops. You're starting to get a little bit of that kind of deep uh, red brown tone in the shadows. It looks really great. And then on the far right, we've got Superior 400. Superior 400 introduces a little bit of um, warmth into the highlights. So if you look at the highlights over here on the side, like right, like right here on her, they're starting to be warm instead of being totally cool like they are in the other two images. You'll even notice that the white wall in the background is starting to pick up a little bit of warmth. And that's, that's a, a very uh, telltale sign of Superior 400. Um, also, the skin luminance is a lot well, not a lot, but a little bit higher in Superior 400, so you get a little bit uh, brighter, clearer skin with that look. But they all look really good. There's no like completely right answer, but these are all really good starting points. Um, hopefully that's helpful. I'll move on. So that, I just wanted to get super in detail with one photo, so you can start to kind of see the difference in all the pieces that it takes to get a really beautiful boudoir image, and then I can edit the rest of the images and go a little faster and show you just kind of the flow of it. Okay. All right, let's do this image next. So this is by Hannah Wagner. And I'm going to go, I'm gonna just, I, I think the original edit uh, that I saw it online was 160. And this is from our community. And here it is, very simple. I mean, I wish I could make it more complicated for you, but that's our thing is that we are simple. We make it simple to get a good edit. Um, I applied Portra 160. I'm going to increase the exposure just a little bit. You'll see that there's a, there's a little bit of detail on the side of their face. That's all you really need. The skin tones look really good. If I wanted to, I could use a tone profile to bring in a little bit of this window without affecting the rest of the image too much. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and do highlight soft. In fact, I'm gonna do, well, let's see, is all soft too much? All right, let's do all soft on this, okay. So highlight soft just brings in the highlights in the window. All soft brings in detail in both 
the highlights and the shadows. And that could be really nice on this image because we don't have a lot of light on the other side of them. So there's a lot of light coming through the back of the window, but there's not much of a, any kind of fill light on the front of them. And All Soft brings that in in a really nice and gentle way. And, and now it just looks fantastic. Um, I don't think it could really use anything else. If you wanted a bit of a warmer look to this image, then I would move away from Portrait 160 and go over to Superior 400. So I'm gonna go back to the Fuji Color Everyday Original Pack. Click Superior 400. Ooh, okay, let me, uh, that's a little bit too much. Let me start with a, just a, a fresh edit. So Superior 400. Um, it's got a really nice warm look. It's not like over the top. And we could do, I don't know, Shadow Soft or All Soft. Ooh, All Soft is really good. Okay, All Soft. And then I'm gonna cool it down just a tiny bit and increase the exposure just a tiny bit. And that's, that's just a really, really nice image. Um, let me show you before and after. So this is before and this is after. Beautiful, simple edit. If you wanted to go one step further, you could do something that has nothing to do with, with our presets or styles, uh, but it's a tool that I really love, and that is in the transform section. If you go through here, you can, you can use these kind of uh, preset buttons here, like transform preset buttons to correct the perspective of the image. And I like to do that in a lot of images, especially images that have a building or a window in them, because I just can't stand it when things are not having perfect perspective. That's just me. Um, but it's a simple thing. You can just hit auto. Um, or maybe auto didn't get it quite right. Let me try full. Okay, no difference. All right, so I'm gonna do auto plus a tiny little uh, extra correction myself. So I'm gonna go to the vertical slider here and just get this, this line here on the side totally straight. That's probably pretty good. Okay, and then if you hit constrain crop, it'll make sure that you don't have any little white gaps here from correcting the perspective. So I just hit that. And now that's like perfect. That's all I want, that's good. Um, it's a beautiful image. Uh, Hannah, you did a great job, I love it. Okay, moving on. Let's do this skylight uh, image here. I really like this one too. So here's the raw image. I'm gonna do my first edit. Let me start with Superior 400 on this one. So there's Superior 400. Looks just fantastic. Like, I, I love one-click edits. They're my favorite. Don't expect one-click edits. Um, they happen if you've been very careful to get like everything, well, perfect in camera. What does that even mean? It usually means just correct exposure. Um, and the white balance in your camera was close to correct. Most of the time it won't be because a, com a, a camera is just a computer. A computer can't know where you were shooting or what kind of light it really was. It's just making its best guess. So it's kind of averaging out all the colors in the photo to get the white balance and it's often wrong. Uh, sometimes it's correct. Or if you're shooting with manual white balance, maybe you just nail it because you're really good at seeing color. But this one was easy. It's just one click with Superior 400. Uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of upright work here to make this bed headboard have the right perspective. So as you can see on the right, it's a little bit further back or it just looks shorter than this side. That's really easy to fix. You can just hit this little honeycomb thing right here in upright. And I'm just gonna draw kind of an outline of this bed because I know I'm gonna just make the assumption that it's square. There, that, that is just so totally amazing. Again, I mean, if you watch a lot of my videos, I just freak out about this because it's my favorite tool, but the upright tool is amazing. Um, I love it. Like here's before and there's after, and it just makes everything just feel really well balanced. Um, all right, so there's that. 
The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do Shadow Soft. That brings in just a little bit of detail back here without kind of ruin, ruining the moodiness of it. And then just as a personal thing that I would like to do, I'm going to take a, um, a brush. And I'm going to just do a, a very, very, very basic uh, dodge. Dodging is when you make a picture lighter in one part of it. And burning is when you make a picture darker in one section. It comes from an actual and larger, when you're doing black and white prints, where you would take a little piece of paper on a wire and you would dodge underneath the light coming down onto your paper to make an area lighter. And then you would then take a piece of card and like make a shape in it or like a little hole or whatever. And then you could move that around and actually burn areas in with more light and make them darker. So that's where it comes from if you have ever want to know why it's called dodge and burn. Um, so I'm going to dodge, aka lighten, just this little area by the fern. Um, just because I want to see a little bit more detail back there. And that, that's a little extreme. I'm going to back off like right about there. All right. So here is the before and after on this photo. It looks really nice and natural and beautiful. Um, and again, I did like some fancy stuff, but the base edit was really simple. It's just using the preset. Uh, I used a tone profile to bring out a little bit of detail in the shadows. And then I did... Did I even adjust white balance? I don't think I did. I mean, that would be the last thing I would do. Maybe bring it down just a skosh. There. And we have a final image. Looks beautiful. So, all right, let's do a few more. I really like this image. It's beautiful. It has a really nice, uh, so just to talk about a, um, composition for a second. What I really love about it is you've got some points of interest at these intersections. You know, if you don't know what the rule of thirds is, just look it up. It, it's like been written about a billion times. But essentially, if you divide an image up into a grid like this, you've got these points of interest. So there's one, two, three, four. And if you put something important in one of those points of interest, it makes the photo more pleasing to the viewer in general. And then on a side note, once you've got this mastered, then you can break this rule and put the point of interest somewhere else completely and you can make it look amazing. But I think you kind of have to know the rule to break the rule well. But in this case, one of the points, one of the points falls almost right on her face. And that's really nice because you've got a point here and a point here kind of by her tattoo, kind of in the middle of her belly. And this makes your eye want to travel, and this is perfect for a boudoir photo, down her leg, up here, right? And then stop at her face. That's a great composition. That's, a, that's really good. So just as a little side note, uh, there's some thought put into this and it's really, really nice. All right, enough about that. I'm going to uh, straighten it just a tiny bit. I'm looking at the window back here. I don't think it needs that tool I showed you, just a simple straighten. And then I'm going to edit this one. Uh, let's see what Superior 400 looks like on it. That looks super good. I'm actually gonna go back to Portra, hmm, maybe Portra 160 from the Portra, the Portra original pack. So there's Portra 160. I'm going to correct a little bit of this towards magenta. If you look at a neutral part of the image and you're seeing a little bit of a green or a magenta cast, that's something that you should try to correct, I think. I mean, totally up to you. You can you know, take artistic liberties, but I think it needs to be a little bit more magenta with the tint slider. And I'm gonna warm it up just a tiny bit. I haven't touched exposure yet. Um, I don't think it needs it. This is a, a moody photo. It's not a light and airy photo. I'm not gonna go like way up here. I guess I could. I mean, it, that looks pretty pretty super as well, but we're gonna keep it dark today. And the last thing I'm gonna do is play with the tone profiles. So let's see what Shadow Soft looks like. 
There, perfect. Shadowsoft seems to be the name of the game today. So Shadowsoft, tiny bit of a temperature adjustment, tiny tint adjustment, a little bit of exposure, nothing major, and you have a beautiful before and after edit. Really simple. Um, on this image, I'm gonna add grain. I just kind of feels like it needs it. So I'm gonna go into our grain section here and we have both 35 millimeter grain. So this grain is the same size for the, the, the area that a 35 millimeter frame is. So like the size of the frame, grain, okay. I'm really big into grain, so I'm gonna explain this. Grain is constant on any size piece of film, whether it be a small piece of film or a big eight by 10 piece of film, the grain is always the same size per film stock for you film nerds out there. Now, the actual size of the film that you're shooting on is determined by what size it was cut at where the film was made, and then that determines the type of film you're shooting, like 35 millimeter film, 120 film, 220 film, eight by 10 film, that's the size of the film itself. So the size of the grain remains constant, but the size of the, the thing that it's on changes. And it's that relationship that we model with Mass and Labs with our grain settings. It's not just like a little bit of grain and a lot of grain. <laughs> These are actually based on the actual sizes of the grain in relation to the size of the film. So 35 millimeter grain is really, really nice, but it's a little bit chunkier because the size of the film is pretty small. Medium format grain still gives you grain, gives you that nice, uh, I don't know, kind of soft grain look, but the grain is much finer in relation to the picture. So in this image, I'm gonna do 35 millimeter grain, and that is what I'm gonna do to finish it. It looks really, really good. Okay, got one last image here. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them and I will gladly answer. Also, if you're coming in late, you're just joining us now, this will be reposted again on YouTube and on our Facebook page, the Mass and Labs community page. So you can always rewatch it and you can share it with friends. So never worry if you come in late, we got you covered and it'll be there for you. Okay, so we got one last image here. So this is again by Stacy. She's a great uh, boudoir photographer. Um, you can look her up online under Noir Stories, N-O-I-R Stories. She's got a great Instagram. And I'm gonna do a quick edit with, let's see here. Let's do Portrait Pushed. So on this image, I'm gonna just see which one feels right. Here's Portrait 160. Push one stop. I'm gonna. I'm actually. I'm gonna give this a bump in exposure first. Let's go like to about there. So there's portrait 160, and there's portrait 160 push two stops, and you can see how much more red it became. I'm gonna do portrait 160, and now I'm gonna do shadow soft, just to bring it out. Actually, I'm gonna do all soft. Increase the exposure again just a tiny bit. And I want this image to be cooled down just a little bit. I'm looking in the shadows here and it's a little bit warm. So cool it down. And then I'm gonna take a brush and I'm gonna do just a tiny bit of a dodge on this side of her face. Okay, that's way too much. I'm gonna bring that down. It's better to have it be too much and bring it down than to not notice it. Easy, easy thing to fix. So there you go, very simple edit. I, I hardly had to do anything. Uh, the, the amount of changes that happen within every presetter style, I think there's like between 70 and 80 small little adjustments, create the color palette and the tonal range and the micro contrast for that film and it can look really, really good in just a few clicks. Uh, we have a question. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Um, when to use grain and when not to use grain? I would say, I would say like, let me find a good example. I think this is a good example. 
So in this image, the, in, in this image, we've got these big spaces here. So Hannah will ask, when should I use grain? When, I sh when should I not use grain or why? I feel like if you have these big expanses here that are out of focus, so like right here behind her on this wall, without grain, let me reset it. They just look super, super, super smooth and digital. Not the digital is bad, but I think if you if you're if you're with Mass and Labs already, you you probably like real film. Um, I feel like if you have these big expanses that are just super smooth and like they they almost look, I don't know, like plastic without grain. And grain just kind of softens that area, and adds a little bit of a mood. Unrealistic grain looks lame. I can't stand it. But this grain is very fine and very, I don't know, very carefully made. Um, and it's just that kind of that last little step to make your image shine. I don't know if you would see this grain like on Instagram if you just like posted this picture really small. It's not like super thick and heavy grain. But definitely on my iMac or, you know, if you were giving this to a client, it, it just looks amazing. So that's when I would use grain. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, everybody. Um, yeah, that was really, really fun. We've got some really great images here. Uh, it was super, super fun to look through them and, I don't know, give you all the best tips I can for shooting and editing boudoir. If you enjoyed this, please be sure to go to our YouTube channel Hit that like button and the subscribe button because we do these every single week. We've got an, a huge catalog of editing videos covering everything from Light and Airy to Dark and Moody to every pack that we make to babies, newborns, weddings, anything you can think of. Really good information. So please join us. It's all free. Really good stuff. Secondly, be sure to go onto Facebook, go into the search bar and type in Mass and Labs Community and join us. We're a really helpful, friendly community. Jerks are, are not allowed, and we're here for the beginner all the way through to the pro. Um, if you wanna see what Mass and Labs looks like on your image, just join us on Facebook on our group. You don't have to own anything, just join us. We want you to be there. Drop an image in as a RAW or a JPEG using either WeTransfer or Dropbox, and either I or Casey or Kyle or someone here will edit it for you and show you what it can look like with Mass and Labs, and you'll probably have like 18 people in the community also show you their edits because we're, we're a very excited community and we love what we do. So thank you for joining us. And until next time, happy editing and have a great day shooting what you love.